following announcement has been paid for by the WZWA Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WZWA Network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California in Fury. Great to be with you all once again. This is a doubleheader two days in a row. Yesterday, I interviewed the one and only Bobby Blaze and here tonight, today for him, tonight for me, this is a thrill for me to come full circle with a couple of guys that I had on the show and I get to speak to their mentor right here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this guy right here, he is the godfather of Wisconsin wrestling. He is the one, the only Tom Rocky Stone. How are you, my friend? I'm great. Thanks to have me. Thanks for having me on. No worries, mate. And I really appreciate your time. And it's interesting sometimes when we have guests on the show, most of the time, the first question is how you became a wrestling fan. But in this case for you, your father, Red Hall, was the ring announcer for uh, AWA in Milwaukee, Green Bay and Rockford for uh, Dennis Hilgart. And uh, so I guess because your father's involved in the industry, that by proxy puts you there as a young man. Uh, so I just want to ask you out of the gate what your fondest memories are back then. And, and was there a particular moment as a, as a young man, as a fan, where you knew that this is something that you were going to do with your life? Uh, it was the night that Red Bass Steen and uh, Hercules Cortez defeated Mad Dog and Butcher in Milwaukee. Right. <laughs> that was kind of the first time I really liked what it was. I was a big Red Bass Steen fan. He was the last, the last baby face I ever cheered for. Uh, <laughs> But I, I really loved Red. I never got to meet him, but I, I loved him. Right. So that was your moment there where you realized, okay, this is something that I want to do. Uh, I know you you start getting involved in, in, in some of the wrestling before you actually start training. And I have read a little bit of your book. And I, I wanted to I wanted to give you the floor to tell this. I found this story hilarious, but um you were you were the timekeeper for a match between Mr. Nick Bockwinkle and Mr. Billy Robinson. Uh, and something didn't go right. Please, uh, for, for the viewers out there who aren't aware of this story, please share that for me. Well, I was the timekeeper, and when the match started, the timekeeper forgot to start his, his stopwatch. So we didn't notice that till they were probably 15 to 20 minutes into the match, having no idea that that was a night that they were going to do a 60-minute time limit draw. So they ended up doing about an 80 minute time limit draw. <laughs> and throughout the match, Nick kept coming over and going, how much time, how much time? And uh, I don't think he was happy when they'd been in there for about 30 minutes. And I said, 10. <laughs> uh, so they had to work a lot harder than they were hoping for. <laughs> did they ever find out the mistake or did you just no, I don't think they ever did. I mean, they may have known it, but uh, I don't. I never. At that point, I wasn't friends with the guys. Right. And I would, you know, they were treating me as an outsider, so they kayfabe me and my. They always kayfabe my dad, and at that point, I had no interaction with them. Fair enough. Fair enough. I just, I, I found that particular story to be one that um, made me laugh pretty hard earlier today. Uh, so it gets to a point where you do start uh, doing some training in a boxing ring with a man by the name of Frank Hill. Could you please uh, tell the viewers out there your experience training with Frank? Well, I don't have a lot of recollection of it. I just know that the ring that we trained on was really hard. I mean, it was a boxing ring. It was on the floor. There was no give to it at all. Uh, I think it was me and Frank and Dick Reynolds, who was another, uh, she was a school teacher who worked for Vern and then went down and worked in Texas a lot during the summers. Uh, but I don't remember a lot other than being so sore from that ring. Uh, that ring was just terrible. <laughs> I can certainly imagine. Uh, so as soon into your career, you, you, you're a wrestler, but then you, you, you take over booking duties as well. 
um, with Federation Hall. And uh, I found this to be interesting very early in your career to have all these duties right out of the gate. How did you find that situation for yourself back then? I don't know, it just kind of happened by the third by the third show I was on there, I was actually running it. I just had more ideas just being around, you know, my dad and what I was seeing down there. And I just had a good mind for the business. I think uh, they just ran their shows to try to make themselves look good. I wanted to run it like a real, even though it was one town, I tried to run it like a territory where what we did on you know January 1st meant something on January 30th when we did our next show right. and they never did that uh and it, it just kind of fell all of a sudden I was I had more ideas than anyone else and so I just naturally took over and everyone seemed to like my ideas so right and, and I've always said that to a lot of uh you know friends of mine or other wrestling marks that I'll, I'll be having an argument with or whatever. And it's uh, not everybody is meant to be in that position. Some people want to be and they, they, they spend their time learning how to, to work, learning how to wrestle, getting good at that. Then they start their own company. A lot of weekend warriors here in Australia for sure. And they, they start booking the shows, but they, they just don't have that creative mind. To, they don't have the ideas. Not everybody can do it is what I'm trying to say. So that's why it's interesting that you mentioned that because you just happen to be a guy that had ideas that came to mind. So that's why that happened. Um, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, one thing in your book that I found uh, another hilarious story, um, you clotheslining a 10-year-old girl. I thought that was tremendous. Could you please share that story with everyone? Well, we, we were trying to figure out a way to get some heat <laughs> with our little fans, and our crowd. And part one of the places we always trained was at Jake the Milkman's house. Uh, he had a farm. He lived on a farm. So we had the ring outside and his daughter, Dee Dee, would come in the ring. She was an acrobat, a kind of a gymnastic type person. And so she would work out with the guys a little bit, even though she was only 10 years old. <laughs> and she decided to take to let me clothesline her on the show. So we had her give my wrestling brother uh, a, pro, a trophy for helping youth sports. And I was a heel. So I didn't like the fact that he was helping youth sports. So <laughs> I attacked him and then she jumped on my back. And I don't think anyone ever expected me to clothesline a 10 year old girl. No one there knew that she was Jake's daughter. Uh, in fact, we almost used that. I almost went back to Kansas city and we were talking, I, would, I was talking with Bob Geigel and we were going to do that to her in Kansas city. She was probably 13 at the time. Yeah. Uh, and then I ended, I'm not going, so it never happened, but, uh, I mean, she took one of the, I mean, I literally took her head off with the clothesline. <laughs> it was a Stan Hansen clothesline. <laughs> to a 10 year old girl. And I don't think anyone, nobody saw it coming. <laughs> that is I mean, amazing. Most girls, girls can't run the ropes and she could. <laughs> oh, that is amazing. I just, as soon as I read that, I'm like, I have to bring this up on the show. This is a, a hell of a story and, and, and props to her for doing that. That's not many 10 year olds would uh, have the guts to, to do something like but that. She and, wanted to uh, do it. So it, good for her. she would have done it in Kansas city. And I mean, she she enjoyed the attention, I think. And I'm sure that you got the desired result from the heat from the crowd. Oh, um, we did. <laughs> we did. <laughs> in, today's want... society, in today's society, I probably would have ended up at the second precinct. <laughs> yep, it was a different time when you could get away with things like that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, lovely stuff there. Uh, I wanted to ask you about wrestling at the Chase in St. Louis because this is obviously a you know a, a very uh, iconic period of time in professional wrestling. And in my research, I was just amazed to see how many guys around then that you'd worked with very early into your career from Bobo Brazil. 
uh, to Dick Murdoch, Roger Kirby, David Von Erich, and obviously Bruiser Brody, who is someone that I wanted to bring up. Because I understand that you were really made to pay your dues during this time. Could you please share a little story about Tom Stone paying his dues? Sure. Uh, actually, in St. Louis, I wrestled under my real name, Steve Hall. Right. Uh, and my very first match there was against Gary Young and Dan Diamond. Uh, and they literally, they would walk away when I tried to grab a hold. And they body slam me or backdrop me probably 15, 20 times in a 10 minute match. Uh, and the St. Louis ring at the chase was harder than the concrete <sighs> on the outside of the, on, on the outside of the building. It was terrible. I was never so sore in my life. Uh, Gary Young, I almost got to pay back, but he didn't show up for a show years later down in uh, Louisiana. But after getting beat up by these two little guys, they were both probably 220 pounds. Uh, I walked into the room where all the boys were and Pat O'Connor said, next taping, uh, you're with Brody. And I did not know Frank Brody at the time. And this was before he had his gallbladder surgery and he was 320 pounds with a V shape and probably the most menacing face of anyone in the wrestling business. Uh, and I walked up to Frank and introduced myself to him. And he said, kid, let me thank you now in case I can't afterwards. Well, that instilled a lot of confidence that my opponent's telling me he might not be able to thank me afterwards after I just had gotten the crap beat out of me by the two young kids. Uh, the match was okay. He didn't hurt me, even though he dropped me throat first in the top rope and I was too stupid to know how to protect myself. And luckily I didn't get hurt, but uh, that was a day that I rode in the back seat on the way home pretty damn sore. Uh, I've never been that sore in my life. That was, but they wanted me to quit. Right. I mean, that was the bottom line. They wanted me to quit. And when I didn't, then I had passed my initiation and nothing like that ever happened to me again. Right. Yeah. It was saying back then, you know, that there was things like that to test people to see if they really were tough well, enough even, to be in this. They group. even broke Hulk Hogan's leg in yeah. training. I mean, everything was, they didn't want people just to be able to walk in and and say I'm a wrestler like they do today. Yeah. Guys are 160 pounds and you've got guys who go in the ring and put their hands in their pockets. I wish those guys had worked with a Harley Race or a Haku oh. or a Saido. Yeah. Uh, because they would have lasted exactly 30 seconds and they would have been out of the business. Yeah. I totally agree with what you're saying. And, and uh, you know, I don't want to get on too much of a rant, but today's wrestling, uh, it it uh, it infuriates me to watch it. I have to watch it because this is something that we do on our YouTube channel. We have to uh, review the current day wrestling. And it's, but it's just, no longer, but it's no longer wrestling. No, I mean, it's, it's all choreographed. There's no, they just, they go out and do what they're going to do. They don't, they don't sell anything. Uh, they take these triple moonsaults off the top rope and they jump right up yeah. so they can do their next one. It, it's, it's not wrestling anymore. I, it's gymnastics inside of a ring. Yeah. I mean, we've already got Cirque du Soleil. We don't need, we, you know, don't need it in wrestling. And, and, and this is why I, I, I love all the older stuff because every, every time I watch it, I believe it. You know, even though I know at this point now, yes, it's a work, but even when I watch it, I still get s s stuck into it and I still believe it because what I'm seeing is suspending my disbelief. I watch today's stuff and I'm like, come on, man. This, the, anyway, <laughs> I don't want to get too much of a rant about it because I could go on forever, but well, so could I, I. <laughs> I completely agree. And the, the hands in the pockets thing, I get it. They're, they're trying to be funny, but mate, 
you're in there and someone's trying to punch you square in the face. You shouldn't be clowning around like that. That's the, that's how you should be looking at the whole situation. Anyway, I wanted to bring up central States wrestling the 19th of July, 1979 at the Memorial hall in Kansas city. You work with Pat O'Connor. Haven't had anyone on the chat uh, on the show to have the chance to talk about Pat. I know he's a big star in the 1950s. How was your experience working with him in the ring? Uh, he was a completely different, his style was completely different than anything I have wrestled before or since. Uh, he had me, the only, I only remember rest, one match we really had. I'm not sure if it was in Kansas City or in uh, Des Moines. We wrestled more than once, but I only remember one. And he had me grab a front face lock. And basically we stayed in the front face lock for about 18 minutes and he would every few minutes fight up and he suplex me. And then he'd tell me to keep the hold. And uh, then he'd go back and he'd sell the, the front face lock. And that was the entire match. It was completely different than anything I'd ever done. But uh, I actually, he actually, shoot shoot with me shot 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 with me yeah in the dressing room one night uh and he had me tied up screaming uncle in the dressing room because i had done an interview that afternoon and called him an old man <laughs> i i was too dumb to not know to do that and i said it's too bad i have to wrestle pat o'connor this legend and they're gonna wheel him out in his wheelchair and when he found that he made sure that uh, he had me screaming, uncle. That may have been in Kansas. I'm sure that was in Kansas City where he had me screaming in the back uh, because we did the interviews during the day and on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but by the time I was wrestling Pat, he was pretty well done. He was a drunk at the time. All right. So he never knew. Uh, in fact, he fell asleep one night against Tank Patton in Des Moines that I had heard about in the middle of the ring, he was snoring. Oh my gosh. So you never knew what you were going to get with him at that time. Right. I understand. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted to bring up 1979, there's a stretch of matches here that I just want to bring up one after another, because I, I just found this to be interesting for me, but uh, the 11th of March, 79, uh, yourself with Kenny J against Pat Patterson and Ray Stevens. The 18th of March with Chris Curtis against Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel. The 8th of April against Jesse Ventura. The 22nd of April, April against Super Destroyer Mark Number 2, which we all know is Sergeant Slaughter. And of course, June 6, 1979 against Nick Bockwinkle. This must be uh, the fast track of, uh, <laughs> of learning how to become a great professional wrestler like you did, sir. How were you feeling during this time, having the opportunity to work with such uh, talented legends of the business? Okay, now I want to make you feel bad because I don't remember any of those. I don't remember ever teaming up with Kenny J. <laughs> uh, I don't remember ever working with Slaughter. Uh, so, I mean, I had a lot of matches that I no longer... They're just there. I mean, wrestling Nick was always a treat because Nick would sell for me. And unlike a lot of guys on television, Nick would actually let me cover him. And I'm sure it wasn't yet that early on, but later on, I mean, he would let me get two counts on him on TV, which I'm sure made Vern unhappy. <laughs> uh, but I... I mean, it was always great to work with those top guys and, and they were always good to me because uh, they kind of knew they could trust me and weren't afraid. So they were willing to actually work. Uh, did, I think, I think you mentioned Pat and Ray. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember working them on TV and uh, they would sell for you. They would have a real match, uh, which was fun. But they were, they were probably the two, two of the greatest of all time. Of course. In fact, Bachwinkle says Ray was the best, and I wouldn't doubt that. I mean, he was just so good. Yeah, and and no worries that you don't remember some of those 
it was 1979. It's it's a it's a long time ago. So I am. Well, there are a lot of matches. You know, and <laughs> you probably eventually have, they all yeah. become. I don't remember any of my matches with Jake Roberts, and I probably wrestled them 15 or 20 times. Right. You know, so I, I know nothing went wrong with them because I usually remember all the the bad matches I've had more than the decent ones. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, another question I wanted to bring up. I've had uh, Barry Horowitz on the show before. I've had Dwayne Gill on the show before. We, I always like to bring this up with, with guys like you. You know, uh, what makes a good enhancement talent? For anyone out there who, who you know, I know what wrestling fans are like. And I know what they're like, and they just, oh, well, you know, the guy never won a match or whatever. Like, but these people, these guys are just as important as the top guys, as far as I'm concerned, because the top guys don't get there unless they have these guys to help them along the way, especially if they're green and they need help from an enhancement guy. Please tell me, what would you say makes a good enhancement talent in professional wrestling? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I was an enhancement talent because I no longer wanted to go out on the road. Uh, I think the key to being enhancement talent is knowing what you're there for. And I I saw a lot of the guy, the real green enhancement talent didn't understand if I was wrestling you and I was putting you over, I would come to you with my ideas, how I could make you look better. Mm -hmm. And once I do that, now, you know, I'm in it for you, not me. You're probably willing to give me a little more and have a match because you know, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I mean, there was, there were some guys who shouldn't have been in the business and I took some of them along to TV, you know, when I was booking television guys, those aren't the guy. I think the, the the real good enhancement talent probably could have all been full time wrestlers. You yeah. know the guys like yeah. Barry Horowitz and uh, George South. Yes. Jake Milliman, uh, Texas Hangman, Mike. Uh, those guys are all good enough to certainly work full time in territories. And when, at, when they were doing the enhancement stuff, they knew what their job was. I think that's the, the real key to not expecting more and knowing that it's my job to get, make them look good. Absolutely. Now, some of the guys who are terrible enhancement talent weren't good enough to make them look good. And yeah. those are the guys that would just get pounded on for four minutes or three minutes and then... They go up for the doomsday device with uh, the road warriors. <laughs> well, I did that too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. Uh, but yeah, I just thought it was important to ask about that because the, these guys are an unsung heroes in the wrestling business. And I want to bring this up because I got really mad the other day because I know wrestling fans these days just drive my, drive me crazy. Uh, there was an, a news article, Barry Horowitz talking about um, WWE uh, doing a little documentary on his career. It's probably going to be like an hour long thing, maybe 45 minutes. I don't know. It, the information isn't out there yet, but this was just a news article. And in the comments section, everyone's like, why would there be a documentary about him? This, that, and the other. And it just, it drives me bonkers that, these enhancement talents don't get the recognition and the respect that they deserve because they all work very hard. You, you, you remember a name like Reno Riggins, if you watched wrestling challenge back in the day, he was on all the time and he never won one, but he, gosh, he made everyone look good. So I just want, I just feel like it's important for me to, to take the time to say that all of these guys are just as important and just as important pieces of the puzzle as your Hulk Hogan's, as far as I'm concerned. But I think all of us got the recognition. We may not have got it from the guy sitting in the third row, but we got it from the guy we're standing across from in the ring. Yeah. And I would much rather have Nick Bockwinkle think that I was worthy to be in the ring with him 
than care whether some guy sitting in the third row thought I should be in there. So, I mean, I got my respect from the Bachwinkles of the world and the Jake Roberts of the world. So I always felt I got the recognition. Well, that's good to hear. I like hearing that. Uh, could you tell me some enhancement guys that you, you're a fan of and you think did good work? You mean from back in the day? Yeah. Well, you've mentioned a lot of them. Barry was very good. Uh, Brian Costello. Uh, and then Reno Riggins. Uh, Jake the Milkman could have been a... In the right territory, he could have been a star. Uh Hangman. I mean, the other three guys you've already interviewed, all of those guys were certainly good enough. Uh, and then you had guys like George Gadaski and Kenny J. Those guys, I mean, they were really good at working with young talent and making the young talent look good. That's it. Accentuating the strengths, hiding the weaknesses is, is the aim of the game. And, well, early, and you're, uh, you're trying to teach them. I mean, it was like when I was in Louisiana, I was booked for quite a bit against uh, Dizzy Golden, who became Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Mm -hmm. And it was my job to get as much time out of him and try to teach him what the hell he was doing. At that point, he was he'd fall down. He had no balance. He was just, <laughs> but, uh, so we had a job to do, you know? And, but I, I think I had a ton of guys living, living in the Milwaukee area who at the end could have been full-time. Uh, one guy was uh, Trevor Adonis who unfortunately passed away at 51 years old a couple of years ago. He, by the end was, probably the best of the Milwaukee group. I, um, I have to say that earlier tonight, I watched a match between yourself and big Scott Hall. It was on the 10th of December, 1986. And I just wanted to break this match down and talk to you about it, whether you remember it or not. I remember it. You do? Cause I, That's what I remember. I'm watching this and I'm like, Everything Tom is doing is has purpose. You, uh, you, you got him in a headlock. He tries to get out. You pull the hair. You get him back in. He tries to get out again. You pull the tights. He got him back in again. He fires up. He gets a bit of a hope spot. You go to the eyes. Now you're using the wrist tape. You're choking him on the ropes. Finally, after he weathers the storm, he catches fire. He finishes you off. This, in my opinion, is what I call a five-star match. None of this bullshit Dave Meltzer goes on about with the Young Bucks and all that today, and they're flip-flopping flying. This is a five-star match because everything that happened in the match had purpose. Scott Hall didn't think it was. A few years later, he, I ran into him in WWF, and he was still mad about that match. That was like his second professional match. His first match had been in Minneapolis and he had hurt Jake Milliman. So I was that match. I actually did in self-preservation. I kept him on the mat, choking him with my tunic and just, I buried him that match. It really wasn't a five-star match because I didn't do what they really <laughs> wanted me to do, but I didn't want to get hurt. And years later in WWF, he came up to me and said, I know what you did that night. Uh, and okay, I didn't get hurt. That was the whole, but that I, match, I, I do remember that because I was going to make sure that uh, I couldn't get hurt. And to Vegas, honest, I think that, that, that happened in Vegas. And Vegas was funny because the dressing rooms were on opposite side of the building. So we couldn't sit and talk to each other. So everything we did, we had to do in the ring, basically. Of course. Uh, which I, none of the kids today could do. Uh, definitely not. And but it, from my perspective, I enjoyed it, and I thought it, it. I thought it made him look good that he had to figure out a way to weather this storm to finally beat you. That's just my opinion. Well, but. I'm glad you liked the match because I, like I said, I was just trying not to get hurt. 
<laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, because some of the some of the green guys that come out came out of Vernon's school, they would actually put them in the ring and not smarten them up. Right, of course. Uh, that happened with Kevin Kelly, uh, who became Nails. Yeah. His first match was in Milwaukee, and it was Brad Riggins and me against him and Steve Regal. And Vern said to me before the match, don't talk to him in the ring. He's not smart yet. Oh, my gosh. He was 300 pounds of all muscle. <laughs> and don't talk to him. Uh, <laughs> needless to say, I talked to him. <laughs> uh, but Vern... Vern protected the business. I understand it, but that's a little ridiculous if you're going to put a guy in the ring and not tell him it's a work. Absolutely. It's dangerous. Uh, uh, could you please tell me about the first time you met one Bull Payne, a.k.a. Frank, and mean Mike Moran? Well, Mike was like a 15-year-old kid, uh, and Jake had been training him a little with Herman Schaefer. And Jake said, you got to see this kid. So I ended up getting him in the ring and uh, he was pretty good. He was another one, just came natural to him. Uh, Bull Payne, I don't really remember. He just started coming to the camp. And Mike said, I actually got him to quit for a while. I don't remember that, but right. I guess maybe. I mean, Bull and I became real good friends. In fact, we vacationed for a while one time down in, we took, went to Reno with our wives. Uh, he got mad at me a few years back and we don't talk much anymore, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I don't, but I, I mean, they were some of the guys who, you know, were good. And they were fun to work with because they wanted to learn they really cared about the business. And I think that's the other thing that the guys back in my day, we cared. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the kids today give a shit. You know, they do to them. It's, it's play acting and. It's a mockery. As far as I'm concerned, it's a mockery. <laughs> um, yeah. I wanted to bring this up uh, because Mike mentioned it to me earlier and I thought it was important. Uh, AWA war in the windy city on the 23rd of June, 1989 at the Odeon pavilion in Chicago, Illinois, you team with the Texas hangman as the executioner taken on the three Guerreros, Chavo senior Hector and Mondo. Please tell me about this matchup. Well, I mean, the, the hang were coming in to work full time for Vern. And for whatever reason, the Guerreros didn't sell for them at all. They <laughs> sold for me, the job guy in the group, which <laughs> made no sense. Now, my guess is that that was given. That, those were orders from Greg and Vern. Right. And I can't right. prove that, but I believe they did it as a rib to the hangman. You know, uh, I don't really remember the match, but I do remember – they wouldn't sell anything that Mike and, and I'm not sure if Tom, Tom or Bull was the other hangman at the time. I think it was, I think it was Bull. Yeah. But uh, they didn't sell anything for those guys and they flew all over the ring for me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure those were orders from the office. <laughs> I'd love to see the footage of that. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would probably be a good one. <laughs> uh, so you know during your time in professional wrestling obviously there's a lot of miles that you got to do and uh and a lot of traveling to do do you have any scary stories on the road of near misses or anything of that nature uh the only near miss was going from baton rouge to shreveport in a in a rainstorm it was a two-lane highway most of the way and I wanted to pull around and try to pass. And uh, I got into the other lane and realized that I had a choice between a head-on collision or the left shoulder. I took the shoulder and we slid down into the bayou. 
Oh my gosh. And so, but I mean, we came real close to doing a head on that night. That's probably the worst thing. I mean, there've been times when you started to fall asleep, but we always had a rule that uh, the guy sitting next to you had to stay awake. And if either you or him started to sleep, you just chop the other guy <laughs> because we didn't want to end up dead. Uh, yeah. But yeah. that night, uh, I know Paul Orndorff was in the back seat. I don't know who was in the front, but uh, we came really close to not making it to Shreveport. That was probably the, that was probably the absolute worst. The only one that was really bad. Yeah, I'll just imagine that, you know, driving so much, obviously <laughs> the odds are when you, the more that you drive, the more likely it is that there could be a, uh, an incident. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> that is some scary stuff. Uh, bringing it back to Mr. Vern Gagne, uh, I just wanted to ask you, what do you feel like you learned most from him? From him? Uh, well, he was my second match. And... Uh, I guess the only thing I remember from that was he put me up against the, he had me against the ropes and I guess I wasn't standing tall and he said, stand up straight kid. And I learned at that point, never to been to try to always stand as tall as possible in the match. And that was probably the biggest thing I learned from Vern. Vern didn't really say much. I didn't have a whole lot of interaction with him. Uh, the guys who tended to, have the most interaction were were Bachwinkle and and Stevens. Uh, so Vern didn't really. I mean Vern. I learned he didn't like a guy like me throwing around a guy like Ken Patera being too loose with my. I, I once gave Kenny a flying mare and I didn't lock my fingers and Vern was, he went ballistic on it <laughs> because he says, you can't do that to an Olympic athlete. And he was reaming me out in the back room and all the while Patero was standing behind him making faces and he had his <laughs> fingers in his ears and he was uh, trying to get me to laugh while Vern's screaming at me. Uh, Fantastic. <laughs> but Vern, the one thing you learned from Vern was to take care of the business, mm. you know, uh, and he did care a lot about the business being real. Yeah. And if you look at the talent he had, it was real. He was an Olympic athlete. Mad Dog was an Olympic athlete. Ken Patero was an Olympic athlete. Saito was an Olympic athlete. I mean, there were a lot of guys in there who were really tough guys. A lot of shooters. <laughs> Interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from there. Um, it, and again, comparing it to now, it is a complete different time. I think I could take quite a lot of the guys going today. <laughs> and I've got well, a 160 pounds. And <laughs> and they let women beat the guys, the, the 300 pound guys. I mean, it's and some some of these wrestlers today, their biggest uh, adversary will be a strong gust of wind, it feels. Uh... <laughs> I mean, it is what it is, but it's not wrestling. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> I know you interacted a lot with Bobby Heenan. Do you have any Bobby Heenan stories? Oh, boy. Uh... Well, I worked with Bobby one night. I think it was in Sheboygan or Fond du Lac in Wisconsin. And uh, I would still work as a heel. So I went to pull him, take him down by the hair. And that way, you know, I could look, tell the ref to check, ask the fans, and they'd all go no. And Bobby didn't know how to, he didn't know how to sit down when I pulled him down by the hair, which I found amazing with all the big bumps he had taken. You know, he was, uh, Bobby was probably one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. He was mm. just, he was unbelievable. Yeah, my friend, uh, my friend Daniel, massive Bobby Heenan fan. 
not as educated as he should be about him because he actually didn't realize until like last year when I told him, yeah, Bobby Heenan used to actually wrestle. And he's like, really? And I'm like, dude, apparently everyone said he could have been the greatest of all time. If, yeah, he uh, started as a wrestler. He didn't start as a manager. Yeah. He was a wrestler for Bruiser. And uh, then he came up to Vern and became a manager, but he still wrestled. Uh, yeah. I mean, there was one night, one night, Bobby had a really sharp wit. We would, we had driven to Sheboygan in a driving snowstorm from the airport in Milwaukee, and he had driven up with Jake. Jake was pretty scary to drive with anyways. And <laughs> this was in a blizzard. And Bobby always had, he was always really fast on, you know, when he had something to say. And we were coming back and I was trying to line up the guys who they were going to ride with going back. And I said, I'll take him and him and him. And Bobby, you're with Jake. And Bobby looked at me and without even batting an eye said, I'll just buy a house and stay. <laughs> uh, there's only one Bobby the Brain Heen, and that's for sure. Uh, another person I wanted to bring up before I start to talk about um, the WWF. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever bit Hulk Hogan? Uh, I didn't bite. I could have. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you the story. Uh, Hogan used to, when he'd cover you on television, and he want to do his little pose for the camera, he would stick his crotch in your face. <laughs> so I gently bit his balls, <laughs> let him know that he was not in control, even though he was po he was the one posing. That at any moment I was the one in control. Yes, that, <laughs> that did happen on AWA TV. <laughs> brilliant, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> had to bring that one up um okay you you've done a lot of work with awa helping making people look good you start doing the same for the wwf even being a time where you're doing both at the same time could you tell me what the difference is for you and your perspective with awa and wwf how you guys were treated when you worked there well wwf treated us really good. Uh, they paid better. Uh, they always had their buffet. Every when we get there, there was a buffet for us. Uh, Greg and Vern, I worked for them a long time. They treated me well. I mean, they, I worked almost every weekend for them. Uh, it was, it, it was, I don't know. It was like a minor league baseball team and a, and a major league baseball team, though. Vern's was a minor league operation, as were all the territories. Yeah. And Vince took it to another level. The only thing is I had a little more say in the AWA. I mean, I could tell Greg, I'm not working with those guys, or let's change it and put him with him. And uh, I didn't have that much power. In the right. WWF, I mean, if it said you're working, you know, that's who you got to work with. <laughs> right, of course. Where I, I had more leeway in the AWA. And some of that was I had been in the AWA from 77 through, you know, through the rest of their time in business. Uh, I mean, I did have a lot of friends in New York because I had worked with Terry Garvin was the guy who booked all of the enhancement talent. I hate that term. He booked all the jobbers. Okay. Do you uh, want me to say that from now on? I'll say jobbers if you want. Jobbers, jabronis. I was okay. a king of jabronis in my mind. So that does not, doesn't bother me. I thought enhancement talent was stupid, trying to make us more than we were. We were there for one reason. It was a job. Yeah. And that's how I looked at the business. I always looked at the business as it was a job. It was like working at the 7-Eleven grocery store on the weekends as a part-time job. I just happened to put on a pair of underwear and go out in front of a bunch of people for my part-time job. And I made a lot more than the guy working at 7-Eleven did. Yeah. No, I understand. And, and I only say enhancement talent because I don't know how someone's going to react because I'm, look, I'm a mark. 
I don't want to be going, oh, you know, you're a jobber here. Because you, you, I know people use that word as a derogatory thing. So it's I, not I, a derogatory I, thing. It's what we, we were there as a job. We were there. We got paid our $125 or $150 or $85 or whatever it was. And we were there. It was a job. We weren't doing it for the next show on at the Coliseum. That was it. It was a job. It was my job to get you over and make you look good. And yeah, they threw me matches, you know, in house shows as well. But my TV stuff didn't have anything to do with those house shows. Right. <laughs> so it was a job. Excellent. And, I, I will correct my vocabulary from here on in this interview. <laughs> well, I might be the only jobber who doesn't mind it, but that's that's what it was. Dwayne Gill yeah. said to me, hey, I'm a jobber. I don't, I don't say that. I'm a jobber. I'm happy to be a jobber. Call me a jobber. So, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to say it's overwhelming how many top guys you work with over the years. Um I want to know who are a bunch that you that you love to work with and who were some that you didn't like working with? Well, I didn't have the only guy I didn't like working well, I was I didn't want to work with the Road Warriors when they first came in to work for Vern because the reputation was that Atlanta told them just to beat the crap out of the job guys. So I refused to work with them. Uh didn't have too many guys I didn't want to work with. Bret Hart was a pain, and that may have been he didn't know me. And Bret's philosophy, I think, was that as a star, he shouldn't give me anything on TV. Uh, so he was a kind of a pain to work with. Uh, Leon White was a pain, mainly because he was so strong, and he did things backwards. He did things he would do this body clothesline and you couldn't take a bump without kicking him in, in the balls. Right. He would. And so to protect him, I ended up getting my face busted open by him and he was mad at me and I was protecting him, you know, uh, because Ray Stevens told me when I first got in the business, the other guy's body is a fine piece of bone china. You take care of it and you give it back to him the same way you got it. Well, Leon didn't have that up, didn't have that. Right. You know, and but other than that, I can't think of too many guys I had a problem with. Right. Because I was looking through the a whole heap of the guys that you got the chance to work with, and I wanted to list a lot of them off. So everyone out there watching this interview knows how many top guys and great performers that you work with. Uh, I know that there was a match where you were involved with superstar Billy Graham at one stage, obviously Ken Patera, the British Bulldogs, Ivan Putsky, Tito Santana, Rick Martel, the Ultimate Warrior, Jake Roberts, Jim Duggan, Coco Beware, Bam Bam Bigelow, the Heart Foundation, Roddy Piper, Dusty Rhodes, the Legion of Doom and Demolition. That's just a bunch. I just wanted to list off there. But one that stuck out to me was the Ultimate Warrior. And I just wanted to know, you know, obviously his name's been out there a little bit more recently with some of these documentaries that have come out. Uh, I've watched your match with Ultimate Warrior earlier today. How did you find working with him? Well, that was another one. His matches were so short. I think if that's the, I don't, I think I only worked with him one time. I don't think he actually got me up on the press slam. No, I didn't. No. I think he was pretty mad after that match because he couldn't get me up. I probably didn't help a whole lot. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, he was kind of strange. I don't remember ever talking to him. I mean, I talked to Macho Man and other guys. I talked to everyone else. I don't remember him ever really. I, you know, he just did the shake the rope thing and hit you with two moves and give you the press slam and you were done. Uh, don't remember that. I mean, I remember that he couldn't get me up for the press slam. I'm surprised. I thought they actually cut that match and never even aired it. I'm surprised it's still out there. Yeah, it's on YouTube. And uh, I noticed because uh, he'd, he'd given you a couple of scoop slams and then I was feeling like, okay, this seems like he's he's heading towards the end of the match. And he grabbed you. And it seemed like he didn't even try to pick you up like that. He just went for a scoop slam, did the splash, one, two, three. And I was like, 
it seemed like he didn't even try to get you up there. I don't know. That was just my opinion. I think I was just heavy. <laughs> you know, Possibly. I don't think I, I, I don't think I really knew how to help him that well on that move. Fair enough. Maybe but... I just didn't want to do it either. <laughs> <laughs> well, with him, you never know, you know, if you're going to get hurt or not back then, especially. Um, but uh, I wanted again, bring it back to uh, the Texas hangman uh, because obviously, you know, this interview for, for Mike is a big one. He's so excited to see our conversation uh, because he and I have become very good friends. He bought me this shirt at Hogan's Hangout, sent it to me, so I thought I'd wear it. Uh, <laughs> but this is a big one for him. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about how you feel about his and Tom when they were the with Texas Hangman and eventually disorderly conduct how you feel that their career went and, and how proud you are of them. Well, I was really glad that they, they got to make some more guaranteed money for WCW. In fact, I never knew that up until two years ago when we were at Trevor's uh, memorial. They told me that they had been on a guaranteed contract, but that was kind of neat to hear that they were getting paid whether they worked or not. And they had a nice run in Puerto Rico. Yes. And, uh, I think they could have had a decent run other places. I mean, Mike is an ex, was an exceptional wrestler, and Tom, Tom became one too. Uh, great guys, always. In, I mean, I enjoyed working with Mike. Uh, we worked. I used to do a Doctor X gimmick, and we'd work mask against mask here in Milwaukee. Do the Hangman gimmick, and he was always fun to work with. Uh, but yeah, it, it was great. They got to go to Europe. They got to go to Japan. Uh, I mean, the one time he took uh, Steve Butler was his other hangman. And yeah. Went to yeah. Korea and came back and uh, Butler lost all of his money that he had made for two weeks trying to get a soda on Christmas Eve out of a vending machine. He got held up at gunpoint. You, you can't make that stuff up. Uh, <laughs> Steve Butler was another one, though, who was a really good hand. I mean, all of those guys, five years earlier, when the territories were still really hot, could have all made it in the territories. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, now that you mentioned it, I did read that story in the book about how his whole payoff was stolen from him and all he still had was just that one can of Coke and that you hope nice. that that Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, man. Fantastic. Uh, did you start winding down your wrestling career in the mid nineties? This is just based on my research. I, I look far and wide on the internet, but as it gets to like 1995, it seems like, um, match results for you aren't as prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. What, what happened was, what happened was, is my son was born in 86. And by the time he was six years old, he could play baseball with 10 year olds. I mean, he was really good. Uh, and I would much rather go to watch him play baseball. When he turned eight, he started playing little league. And by the time he turned eight, so it was 1994. I never missed a game. Uh, so I would rather go to watch him play baseball than be out on the road. Uh, and as I got older, there were less opportunities, you know, yeah. I didn't really yeah. want to, you know, so it just kind of, they were get they were kind of phasing the job guy out. Right. Of course. And going to all main event matches. That makes uh, sense. Because around that time they started, TV was, you know, wrestling challenge was now kind of gone. Uh, TV was mostly, you know, competitive matches between, you know, bigger name guys. I mean, my, the last match I actually remember was in Rockford. And I, I couldn't even tell you what year it was. I just know Sherry Martell was there. Luna was there. Brunzel was there. Barry Horowitz was there. And I don't remember working a house show after that point. Right. Uh, it just kind of, but I would, much, again, I want my, and my kid was playing on three little league teams. So he was playing every night of the week. He was, 
he was on a traveling team. He was on two local teams and we prioritized them A, B, and C, and we always went to A, and then we go to B if we could. So I was much more into watching him play baseball at the time. Fair enough, and, and props to you for, for because, you know, what is one of the biggest tragedies of the wrestling business? Um, kids that growing up don't get to see their parents, don't get to see their father because he's on the road 300 days a year. They miss out on the, all these important things. Even Ric Flair got suspended from WCW for wanting to see Reed Flair's wrestling tournament um, when he was booked for a Thursday Thunder. Um, so, you know, it, it's important that you did things like that and you chose that, that path, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and at that point, I had had my, I'd been doing it since 77, you know, so I'd been wrestling for 17 years. My body was kind of, it wasn't nearly as much fun at that point anymore. Right. I think um, a lot of those guys that were still uh, doing the jobs in the early 90s, like a Barry Horowitz, they were able to still keep in there in WCW because the Saturday night program, that gave opportunities for them to still do that thing. Um, because that program was essentially most of the time job matches with maybe one competitive match for the main event. And I just wanted to put that out there that, that this is like the, 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 the dying part of that part of the industry, as far as I'm concerned. But one thing I wanted to bring up was, uh, if you remember it, 22nd of March, 95, Kevin Sullivan and the butcher, which is British, the barber, uh, take on Steve Hall and Steve Storm in a match on Saturday night in Atlanta, me. Georgia. It wasn't you. It wasn't me. I'd okay. never been to Atlanta. That was someone else using the name. Right. That, okay. was, that was someone else as a rib. There also was another guy. Really? Wrestling was Tom Stone uh, on some show somewhere. Uh, I think those were just, those are ribs from whoever was booking. Right. Was okay. Not, not me. I never worked at Atlanta. Okay, well, I will, um, because the website that I get these match results from, I email them every now and then when I find out that something's incorrect. So I'll make sure that that gets removed off your profile. <laughs> uh, can you please tell me what your, your last match in the wrestling business was? Because again, from my research, all I can see was that it was possibly in Wisconsin organized wrestling in uh, on the 15th of April 2006 in a three-way match with Matt Longtime and Nick Colucci uh, in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, but again, could be wrong. No, that wasn't my, my last match was in 2012. It was either late November or early December. Uh, I wrestled Steve Carino for Brew City Wrestling. All right, cool. And uh, I had become friends with Steve. He had, he was coming up wrestling, wrestling for Frank DeFalco here in Milwaukee. And he put on a clinic one day and I went just to hear what he had to say about the business. I wanted to see how the business had changed and we became friends. And he finally talked me into wrestling. This is a year after I'd had heart surgery, less than a year. I had heart surgery right before the Packers. Uh, I was in the hospital when they beat Atlanta before winning the Super Bowl. Uh, so it was like January that I was in the hospital and this is November. Unfortunately, I had real bad cataracts at the time and I couldn't see two feet in front of me and we locked up and I broke Steve's nose and knocked his tooth out. And, uh, in fact, he talks about it in the book. Uh, yeah. that was actually my last match. And my match, the match before that was, it was in Oak Creek, but it wasn't against, it was against Steve Butler and two other people. And I had the hangman and I think Trevor as my partners. Right. We did a deal where I was trying to take over Butler's group. And then, so those are my last two matches, but they were probably six years apart. Oh, I see. Okay. Interesting. And, and I'm so saying, I, had, I would actually like to work one more time, but I can't get anyone to book me. Well, I'd like to get six six decades. That would be cool, you know. I'm sure there's got to be some sort of uh, 
you know, uh, show where you, I mean, would you consider like a battle royal or something like that? There's a bunch of. Nah, I like, wanna, if I want to work, I want to work a match. You want to want to work as a heel, and that's the hard part. How do you have a 67 year old man work as a heel? You know, <laughs> I, I don't want to be a baby face anymore. I'm done with that. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I hope it happens for you. And to think that Tom Rocky Stone might still have one more left in him is, a, for me, I would love to see it. And uh, I hope it happens. If this is something well, that you want, never, wrestlers should never retire because they never actually stay retired. <laughs> if it's someone makes, someone calls them and offers them another match, they're always going to take it. Yeah, I think the only person who's never done that was Stone Cold Steve Austin. He's the only one who had that final match and then just did not have it again. I thought Shawn Michaels might do that. Well, too, he has a broken neck up... too, doesn't he? He does, yeah. 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 Um, Some people are smart not to want to get paralyzed. That's it, my friend. And uh, I, I, I really want to thank you again for this interview. Before we get to our final segment, there's a few things... Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about. Firstly, do you have any regrets on your time in the wrestling business? Maybe that I didn't stick it out and actually try to do more. But at the time, the business was changing. Changing. They wanted it was all becoming bodybuilders, the nails, and the you know the just the humongous guys. And I was never going to be that. I just didn't get into the weightlifting thing. Uh, other than that, I don't have any regrets. Uh, That's good. I had fun. I was respected by the boys. And uh, I mean, there's nothing more fun than when you can lead a crowd and get them to do exactly what you want them to do. And none of the guys will learn that today because, you know, they pre-plan everything. And whether yeah. the people like it or not, they're going to do what they're going to do. In fact, That's, as irritating as it was, I, I got to tell this story. I was at a local show here, and one of the guys started clapping, and all the people started clapping with him. Yeah. He stopped because it was time to do something. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out, you do this for the people who bought a ticket. If they're clapping with you and they're into what you're doing, why would you stop them? to do something else. <laughs> it just makes no, no sense at all. And it just drives me nuts. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I understand. Uh, other than that, though, I have no, no regrets. I, uh, Good. Well, I like to hear that. You know, I like to hear that people don't have regrets. As some people have had on the show, I can tell have had a lot of regrets and, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking for them for the one thing that they're known for, for them to have bad feelings because of this or that didn't go the way that they wanted it to, um, you know, during their prime. So it's good to hear that, sir. And, and now I want to give you the chance to plug Anything that you have going on, let anyone out there that is a Tom Rocky Stone fan know. And obviously, you want to tell everyone about professional wrestling, the theater of the absurd. I never wanted to be a big star. Your book that you've uh, released. That anything well, else you want? It just got released and it's available on Amazon if anyone wants to pick it up. It's a Kindle version and a uh, paperback version. Uh, it's really just stories of my days uh, on the indie scene or the outlaw scene, as we called it back then. My days in Mid-South, my days in Kansas City and AWA and WWF. Uh, most of it has nothing to do with the wrestling. It's the stuff around the wrestling. Uh, yeah. I mean, there are some wrestling stories, uh, but... Uh, Everyone who's read it seems to at least find some parts enjoyable, if not yeah. the whole book. Uh, so, I mean, if anyone wants to find it again, it's called uh, Professional Wrestling, The Theater of the Absurd. Other than that, I have nothing going on in wrestling. I don't own any memorabilia. I don't own any boots. I don't own any gear. It's all, again, I treated it like working at 7-Eleven and... Uh, <laughs> I didn't keep any memorabilia. Uh, I don't do any card shows. I don't go out and try to sell yeah. trinkets, even though the AWA is, Greg Gagne is putting out a 
set of trading cards and video games. And I'm not sure what else that actually guys like me and Jake and Frankie DeFalco and Chris Curtis are all going to have action figures, supposedly. Wow. And we just signed, so that should be happening maybe soon. Oh, well, that's uh, fantastic to hear. I did tell Greg I didn't want to do jobs on the video games. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> he asked me if I wanted to get paid, so I guess I will do jobs on the video game. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of neat uh, from Greg after all these years. Uh, but other than that, I'm kind of out of the business and doing your thing. I moved on with my life, retired and putting my feet up. Love to hear. Can, it. I, can I give a shout out though? I saw something on the inter- on on, on uh, Facebook the other day. I don't look at it a lot, but I saw a clip on Paul Orndorff. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was the most really sad. And uh, if anyone can wants to say a prayer for Paul, uh, he was a tremendous wrestler. In fact, in all my years in the business, he had the biggest single pop I've ever seen from a crowd uh, when he was working a hair match with Ken Mantell down from Mid-South. But Paul was such a good athlete, uh, and to see him in the condition he's in, I really, if people can say a prayer for him, I would love it. Absolutely. I saw the, the clip as well, and it broke my heart. Uh, so everyone out there, please, a prayer for Paul Orndorff, legend, and uh, still will always be Mr. Wonderful. Um, so thank you for that, um, sir. Uh, Okay, um, before we finish, here's my segment. It's Five Second Frenzy. We're going to bring the mood back up here. Tom Rocky Stone, Five Second Frenzy, each question. Okay, look, I have, I have this rule where you have to answer the question in five seconds. But if you can't answer it in five seconds, I'm old. Okay. you got to give me time. I need to give you time. That's fine. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> the first three about wrestling. The rest, no more wrestling talk. Okay, I promise you. First question, I already know the answer, but please tell me again. Your favorite wrestler? Ray Stevens. Oh, okay. Ray Stevens is uh, number one. Excellent. Uh, favorite opponent that you had over the years? Bachwinkle in the AWA. Jake Roberts in Mid-South. Uh I don't think I had any in Kansas City. And probably Jake Roberts in, uh, actually Brutus in uh, WWF because we got paid extra for the hair and Uh we were friends. So he never took any off. He'd take a little snip off the back of mine (laughs) where he would just destroy some people. (laughs) In fact, there's a story in my book that people would get a kick out of where Chris Curtis Actually got shaved bald three days before his wedding. <laughs> I remember now. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not telling the story on this show because you've got to buy the book, ladies and gentlemen. There's some cracking stories in there. Next question, Tom Rocky Stone. What was the favorite match that you ever performed in? Wow. Uh, Jake Milliman and me in Des Moines, Iowa. No, it wasn't in Des Moines. It was in Moline, Illinois. Uh, we uh, this was a week after Patera and Sato went had done their they had their problems with McDonald's. Oh, I see. Yeah. And uh, Jake and I worked the opener there, and uh, we worked a main event match. There was no one on the card who was going to follow us. Uh, it was probably one of the best matches I ever had, and uh, even the referee thought that I was stiff and I was, I was light as a feather that night. Uh, wasn't always light as a feather, but I was that night. So if the referee thinks you're, it looked real. Yeah. Had to look pretty real. <laughs> and I always enjoyed working with Jake. That was probably my favorite match. Awesome. Awesome. I love the little backing story there too. Uh, okay. Away from wrestling now. Favorite book. Favorite book. 
uh, well, I want to date myself. If I say this, someone's not going to buy my book. Uh, it's got to be one of Glenn Beck's books. Okay. Uh, it, any of his, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, because unlike Jim Cornette, who I agree with on wrestling, I don't agree with on politics. I am a right wing Republican. I see. Fair enough. Uh, okay, the next one. Look, now, some people, they have a hard time with the next two questions. If you can't think of anything current, think back to when you were a young man. That might help. Uh, favorite TV show? Favorite The Americans. Nice. Uh, favorite film? Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Haven't heard of that one, but I'll check it out. Uh, favorite? Paul Norman and Robert Redford. Oh, well, I worked at a theater back when I was 17, and then I actually saw it like over a hundred times. Really? But it's, it's a tremendous movie. If you can watch it, it's one of the best of all times. Okay, this is why I love this segment because I get to learn about film. I'm big on film, so I'm going to check that out. I got one more TV show. Can I add a second one? Sure. White Collar. Nice. I love Mazi. <laughs> uh, the next one favorite musical artist Willie Nelson excellent excellent but, but, could, country but, could, be, but could be David Allen Coe or it could be Roger Krieger who's a Texas artist those are probably my three nice nice uh, favorite food pizza we get that a lot on the show pizza but, I think, but I think it used one. to be it used to be there used to be a burger place in Reno, Nevada, and they had what was called the Awful Awful Burger. I would actually, I lived in Nevada for a while. I would drive 60 miles to get an Awful Awful Burger. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the little casino closed over the pandemic. Oh, that's a shame. But it's no longer, but it was the best burger ever. Wow. Um, well, I guess the next question is usually your favorite place to eat on the road. Would that be your favorite place? Well, I never ate there on the road. Fair enough. When we ate on the road, I'd have to, no, I'd have to say Waffle House. <laughs> number one answer, as usual. It's like if this was family food, feud, the number one answer would be Waffle House. <laughs> uh, favorite alcoholic beverage? Don't drink. Okay. Favorite. <laughs> haven't had a drink. General. Haven't had a drink since I was in Mid South. And I got, I drank blackberry brandy one night in Greenville, Mississippi, Greenwood, Mississippi, and passed out in the bathroom when they carried me home. I went and got up the next morning with no hangover, had a big breakfast. I've never had a drink since. Right. Okay. Well, no alcohol involved then. What's something that you would just go to if you're thirsty? Uh, I drink Diet Mountain Dew. Nice. Very good. Only because I'm diabetic and I'm not supposed to have Dr. Pepper. Oh, fair enough. I'm a big fan of Dr. Pepper. Uh, the second last one here on Five Second Frenzy, the naughtiest one. What is your favorite female body part? If you're going to be checking out a woman, what is something that your eyes will go to first? Well, that's not a good question. You never know. Sometimes people come up with very creative answers. It's not just about the usuals. It could be something else. Well, I guess I'd have to say their ass. <laughs> fantastic fantastic sometimes people say eyes even though, even you though when you look at the ass you are thinking about you know that other part near there <laughs> the part we're all trying the part we're all trying to win <laughs> absolutely and i think the part that you're speaking of is was was what mike moran's answer was uh <laughs> and the final one here tom rocky stone I don't know if you've sworn or said any swear words so far, but do you have a favorite curse word? Well, I grew when I worked in Mid South. I worked under Buck Robley, and every sentence that Buck did, and I ended up picking up on it. When he would lay out a finish, it would be something like, uh, or just a high spot. Give him one fucking tackle, and then fucking pick up up and go to fucking body slam and then 
<laughs> fucking go to cover him and then he can fucking kick you in the face and then you take a fucking bump and so <laughs> I guess that's it. <laughs> that's and if anyone fantastic. wants to learn, if anyone wants to learn to talk carney, it's actually in the book. I teach people how to talk carney in the book. So if anyone wants to figure that out, they can pick up the book. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, Tom Rocky Stone, AKA Steve Hall. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. My face hurts from laughing two days in a row. My face hurts from laughing and smiling. This was so interesting. And, and I didn't want to, uh, jump into too many stories from your book because I want everyone to buy the book because it's fantastic and, and it's a really, really good read. But what we got here tonight was some great stories and I really appreciate you taking the time. And I live in the most isolated city in the world, Perth, Western Australia, you know, and I just want you to know that all the way over here, I appreciate what you did in your career in the wrestling business and what you've done in life. I really appreciate your time and I just hope you're very proud of everything that you've done in your life. Oh, I am. And I appreciate you having me on. The one thing you were going to ask me though, you didn't ask me. Okay. You said you were going to ask me about what I'm doing now. I basically spend my day at the dog park with my two Siberian Huskies. <laughs> I had to put, I had to bring them in because they're <laughs> the love of my life. Timber and Teddy, uh, of course, so I, of course. I had to find a way to get them into the story. Excellent, excellent. Well, and, and I know owning huskies, that's a lot of work, that's a lot of fur uh, to deal with with them. So uh, <laughs> you, you're still working hard at this age. Uh, so I, I want to thank you very much for your time. It, it really means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to Mike and Tom, and maybe not Bull, but <laughs> those two at least, they're going to love seeing this. So I really appreciate being able to connect with you, sir, and, and, and thank you again. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. No problem, sir. And ladies and gentlemen, that was my interview with Tom Rocky Stone, jobber extraordinaire. I am your host with the most on the West Coast, California Inferior. Thank you for joining me, and we will see you next time. Thank you.